All right, so growth tree and diagrams. This is the way we organize the energies of the atoms. And we sort of estimated those with the ground state electron configurations, uh, but then all of the excited states, like how do we understand the energy of the excited atoms? They're still atoms. They still have the same number of electrons as they have uh, protons, and so they're still neutral. But think about all the different ways we could put electrons in the different orbitals. It's crazy how many options we have. Okay, so that's what this is sort of a way to, to organize all of those excited states. So let's start simply with the hydrogen atom. So this is the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. It was one of the big four or five experiments that couldn't be explained by classical physics because they had figured out the nucleus, Rutherford had discovered the nucleus. J.J. Uh, Thompson had discovered cathode rays, which they didn't know what those were, but they eventually realized they were electrons. So he put a voltage against, you know, from one electrode to another in a vacuum, and he started to see evidence that there were rays going from one electrode to another in a vacuum. So they put a fluorescent screen in front of it, and the electrons were streaming off the negative electrode going to the positive electrode. And he saw them hitting the screen, so he saw this light pop up. Um, he could put a um, like a little bit of a gas in there and the electrons would ionize the gas and so you could see the electrons and and so then they could steer them with electric fields so they knew they were negative. Then they put them through a magnetic field and they got the charge to mass ratio and so they're like okay it's charged it has mass so they did all these experiments and they finally figured out this is an electron and it's coming out of the, the negative electrode. Uh, we can send this electron beam and control where it goes. We hit a phosphor screen, it lights up. Hey, let's make a vacuum tube, put a cathode in here, shoot these cathode rays to the screen, and we can see pictures on the other side, and that was the television. <laughs> okay, so the old cathode ray tubes were, were cathode ray tube televisions, and it was black and white. They just had a phosphor screen. And then they got really precise at where they could send those electrons. And so they had three different phosphors that would give you color. And so they were hitting individual color points on those little triplets of phosphors. And so they could make color television. And when that lasted for, you know, 150 years, and then we got into the flat panel displays just about 30 years ago. So went, you know, down there everywhere. Right, but but the old cathode ray tubes with the big, huge glass thing and weighed a ton because of all the electronics. Um, so they they saw this emission spectrum of hydrogen and they knew there was an electron on the hydrogen, and why that electron didn't have a, a continuum of energy was a mystery. This definitely showed that the electrons could be excited and they could drop down, they could emit light, and it was only discrete transitions because transitions are differences in energy levels, remember that. So they knew that the energy levels were quantized, but they couldn't understand why that would be in nature. And then they discovered wave mechanics, and that explained why you had certain resonances around the atom. So Schrodinger solved that problem for the hydrogen atom. <laughs> These were the fellows, Passion, Brackett, Palmer, and Lyman, who did different papers or experiments on the hydrogen atom. So they were able to <clears throat> discover these different lines. Now, only one of these series is in the visible range. Uh, so wavelength up here, so these, these larger numbers and wavelength, these are, um, where's my pen? Hmm. Tablet. There it is, okay. So these longer wavelengths, these are in the infrared. And then these are the UV ones. <clears throat> so the Balmer series, three of those Balmer lines are in the visible range. And those are the first ones we saw when we did the, when scientists did the hydrogen atom experiment. Then Passion found more in the infrared, Brackett found more even in the far infrared, and Lyman found some in the UV. So then they said, well, we can we can number these series based on this series of integers. So Rydberg put these um, integer series on here, Rydberg. 
but they didn't know what the integers meant. So they were able to label these and they're like, okay, look, if we had, um, you know, all of these are from N equals two down to one, three down to one, four down to one, five down to one. So they knew that they could be labeled by this series of integers and you could have a constant in front that would tell you the energy of the, of the spectral line. So there's the Rydberg constant and you have the different quantum number transitions, but they didn't call them quantum numbers because they didn't know what that, what those numbers meant. <clears throat> and so then we want to organize these. If you look at this, it's kind of organized, but they don't know about P orbitals or D orbitals or anything like that, but they do know about the principal quantum number. So this turned out to be the principal quantum number. So N, in this case, is the principal. It's AL in this case. Okay. For like top principle. <clears throat> LE is like a, a principle, like a statement. Like a, mm -hmm. And principal, I always think the principal means it's at the top, it's primary, and your principal, AL, is your pal. If it's a good situation, if it's not a good situation, you're not your pal. But anyway, <laughs> in the best situation, your principal is your pal, and the principal is up at the top. So principal, uh, AL means the top thing. So the top quantum number is N. Now, the energy levels in a Grotrian diagram <clears throat> are the energy of the whole atom. I think this is a confusing point for many students. Okay, they're not the energy levels for individual orbitals. It's real easy to look at the... the, uh, the Grotrian diagram and think that that the one s orbitals down here, the two the two s orbitals here, the three two p is here. That's the way it works for hydrogen because there's only one electron in hydrogen. But when we go to helium and above, which is everything else in the periodic table, then each little energy level is a whole electron configuration. So it's the whole atom at that energy, the whole atom at that energy, the whole atom at that energy, and every one of those levels has a different electron configuration. So let's look at one. So here's the Grotrian diagram for hydrogen. And in hydrogen, then this is the 1s, uh, 1s orbital. So the, the, the electron configuration for this particular spot is 1s1. And for that one, it's 2s1. And for that one, it's 2p1. And for this one, that's the first available d, so that's 3 D1, and that one, uh, 4, F1. Okay. So you see, for hydrogen, since there's only one electron, every one of those levels is essentially the energy of that orbital. So that's the only time that's the case. When we get to helium, you'll see it's more complicated. So the Grotrian diagram shows the energy levels, N and L. So up here at the top, SPDF, that's lowercase l is equal to 0, one, two, and three. And we don't have M sub L levels shown here, but they would be triply degenerate. So this little piece right here, if we break it down here, would have M sub L equals minus one, then one for zero, and then one for plus one. So those are your three quantum numbers, and then you put a spin up or a spin down electron in there, and that's your fourth quantum number. Okay. In like magnetic or electric fields, we do see differences in these, but this would be, I'll just introduce this term, hyper fine splitting. In extremely high resolution experiments, you can see these tiny doublets or triplets, and you can get some information about the M sub L quantum number. But for the most part, you just see in a low resolution experiment, you just see one peak. And inside that peak, you have three transitions for these M sub L levels. <clears throat> now look at, the, look at the arrows, the patterns of the arrows. These are emission transitions. And so, uh, electrons have been stripped off the hydrogen, so you got a proton and a gas, and an electron sees that proton and then drops down into the energy levels. And they come in up here, so <clears throat> this is the ionization limit. <clears throat> and 
And so let's say that uh, an electron, uh, you know, pops in right here. It ends up in this p orbital. It can emit light and say drop down to this level, and then it can emit light and drop down to that level, and then it can emit light all the way down to here. And so one electron, as it hops through all of the wave functions in that atom, can emit all kinds of light as it makes its way down to the ground state. And, the, and it's giving off uh, the light so it can get closer to the nucleus. So it's hopping down, uh, it's uh, kind of like parkour, you know, it's hopping from <laughs> railing to stairs to chair to the ground, trying to get closer to the nucleus. And notice there are some transitions it doesn't make. It doesn't hop straight down. Why is that? Well, if I go from the n equals three, so the three s down to the two s, I haven't changed l, and l is the angular momentum quantum number, and so this is a selection rule. The principal quantum number is unrestricted, but the angular momentum quantum number is restricted. So delta l is plus or minus one only. So you see how the arrows are just going diagonally one column. They're going from L equals one to L equals zero for these, these, these arrows right here. So these arrows right here are delta L equal minus one. It's going from L equals one to L equals zero. <coughs> it's plus or minus. And so you could go this one right here that I drew, you know, this one, right there is delta L equals plus one because it's going from zero to one. It's dropping in N, but it's going up in L and that's totally okay. So they can go left and right, uh, but they, and they can drop, they can even absorb and go up. So absorption is a thing, but we're just talking about emission here. Uh, these right here, what's uh, delta L for this one? Well, it's going from two to one. So it's still delta L equals minus one. Uh, so this one is a forbidden one. I'll put a little X on it. So the one that's going straight down, I put an X on. And then this one, D, jumping past the L column and going over to S, that's also forbidden. Okay, because that would be a delta L of minus two, going from two to zero. So those are like lines I could draw, but I go to experiment and they don't show up. So the, the selection rules greatly simplify the spectrum. We would see lots more lines if we didn't have that restricted selection rule. So there's a reason why the spectrum is simple, and that's the, the angular momentum, the preservation of, of angular momentum. Light has one unit of angular momentum, and, uh, and it can either donate it to the atom or take it away from the atom. You know, so that's, uh, that's why we have this plus or minus one for the angular momentum quantum number. So let's look at helium. <clears throat> Here's the Grotrian diagram from helium for helium. And look at the spectrum over here. It's much more interesting. We have a red photon or transition, a yellow, some green ones with lots of little fine lines in here, a bunch of blue transitions. So we just added one more electron and we got all kinds of new spectral lines. And, and so we have now a difference in energy in the p orbitals as opposed to the s orbitals. So the 2p and the 2s now are no longer the same energy. And we've got all kinds of, uh, of new spectroscopic information. And then we even have singlets and triplets. And we'll discuss what that is today. But we still see, notice the lines still go left or right one column. That's still the delta L quantum number. Or, or the, um, yeah, the delta L selection rule. So the ground state of helium is aufbau like Do y'all know what the alf, what that alf, word aufbau is? That's the traditional scheme of building the electron configurations that we were using last time. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's So if we wanted to write out helium, what would be the helium electron configuration? Just quickly, what's helium's electron configuration? 1s... 1s2, exactly. So that's the Aufbau uh, electron configuration, and that's the ground state of the atom. So what we did in terms of coming up with those electron configurations was the ground state of the electron, uh, of the atom. 
And so the excited states are more complicated. So here's what, so this is the same Grotrian diagram just spread out with the electron configurations on it. So sit there and, and chew on that for a little bit. Look at, look at all of the energy levels. All of them have a different electron configuration. Do you see how they, they start to make sense as you look at them for a little bit? Look at that first column. That first column, all the electrons are in S orbitals. But yet the excited atoms have the electrons in different S orbitals. So the ground state is 1S2, but you could still put electrons in S orbitals if you had one in, a, in the 2S. So this one is 1S1, 2S1. We just don't put the ones. This is 1S1, 3S1. 4s1, 1s1, 4s1. Now somewhere in here perhaps is an energy level where we have a 2s, 3s, but we don't really see that very much. That's going to be pretty excited because I've excited both electrons. It seems to be the trend that I've seen in, in these uh, electron configurations that these lower energy electron configurations, one electron stays put and it's the other one that hops around. And so we always have in this case one of those electrons in the 1s. And then we've just hopped the second electron around and we have all of these different atoms. Okay. And these are all excited atoms. None of these are ions. Once we go above the ionization limit, then we have the same kind of Grotrian diagram, but with the ion. And then it's just a 1s1, a 2s1, a 2p1, or whatever, and that would be for the helium cation. Okay. Um, we still have this selection rules. So we're going left or right one column. We've shown some of these dotted lines just to show you that these are forbidden transitions and uh, and so they shouldn't appear. If they do appear, they're typically weak, okay, because there's some sort of symmetry breaking thing that allows them, but, but for the most part, the red ones are the strong lines. Now, what's going on with this singlet triplet thing? So let's, let's take this, this energy level here and let's, let's write it out. So we have one, uh, orbital that's the 1s okay and we've got an electron in it and then we have another orbital that's the 2s and we have an electron in it okay oh I did that wrong so down here we have the 1s oh let's see so we have a spin up electron and a spin down electron So the net spin is, is uh, the spin of electron one, of sub s, one, is equal to plus one half, and m sub s two is equal to minus one half. So when you add those together, the spin is equal to zero, and the multiplicity is equal to 2s plus 1 and s equals 0 so the 0 goes there so the multiplicity is 1 and we call that a singlet so this idea of multiplicity it's it's kind of a, a different word than degeneracy but it really kind of means the same thing it's 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 how many ways we can put these electrons together. And there's only one way to put the electrons it together in this configuration where they're spin paired. Okay. Um, what about this one up here, 1s, 2s? What if we had these two orbitals where we had a spin up electron in the 1s and a spin up electron in the 2s? MS1 is plus one half, MS2 is also plus one half. We add those together, S is equal to one, and the multiplicity, 2S plus one, okay, is um, two times uh, one is two, plus one is three, so that's a triplet.
And so this is this is what we're talking about with singlets and triplets. Singlets have paired electrons. So uh, this multiplicity, one way to think about this, multiplicity minus one is the number of unpaired electrons you have. So let me just, let's write that out. Multiplicity minus one is the number of unpaired electrons. Now in all of your Gaussian calculations, you had to put the multiplicity of your atom or molecule. You may not have understood what that was, but if essentially with all of your regular molecules, your organic molecules or what have you, if you have zero unpaired electrons, it's the singlet. So you put zero charge, singlet, everything. You just do that all, all the time, but occasionally, you get a molecule like oxygen where those electrons are not paired in ground state oxygen and you had to put a triplet. So this is what it's talking about. And multiplicity minus one is the number of unpaired electrons. So singlet, that's one, is the multiplicity. Minus one is zero, so zero unpaired electrons over here. Zero unpaired electrons. And triplet, so three minus one equals two unpaired electrons. So all of those on the right have the electrons all spin up or all spin down, but they're unpaired, okay? The, all the ones on the left, the electrons are paired up, even if they're in different orbitals. So it's kind of strange. You've got one that's say down in the one S and one that's up in the two P or the 3D or something like that. But it's still a singlet. That whole atom, if you count the spins of the electrons, they're opposite of each other, they're paired up, so there's zero unpaired electrons, so it's a singlet. And in the triplet, they can be in different orbitals, but if they're both spin up or both spin down, you have a triplet. Okay. This is helium. Does anybody have any questions or anything that I can clear up? Yes? They are forbidden transitions that might, I think they're on here because they might appear, like there might be those lines in the spectrum, but they're weak typically. So because they're forbidden, and why are they forbidden? What's going on with this one right here? Notice that electrons going from the d orbital down to the s orbital. So that's a change in two for, the, for L. So delta L equals minus two. I'll say plus or minus because it could go up minus two. And so uh, that's a no-no, oops. Forbidden. And we'll see that in spectroscopy. Sometimes uh, like this singlet to triplet transition will be forbidden, but it'll happen, but it'll be weak. And we get to phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is a forbidden transition. So because it's forbidden, it takes a long time to occur statistically. Some fluctuation in the universe happens and then it can, it can go. And so it leaks out. And that's why the glow-in-the-dark stuff works. You know, the, you charge up your glow-in-the-dark Halloween cup and then you're walking around and it's still emitting light because it's been excited and it can't get back down without some statistical anomaly allowing it because it's forbidden. This is delta L equals zero and so it's also forbidden. Good question. Any other things I can clarify? clarify? If I took all of these electron configurations off of this chart, you should be able to put them back. Okay. And this seems daunting right now, but study it, it's not that bad. You have the columns. So that first column above the 1s2. And notice down here, we've got a little key. 1s1, ns1. So if you've got this little key, can you figure out how to do this whole column? So the second n could be equals one, so then it would be one s two, but then the, the second n could be two, or the second n could be three, or the second n could be four. And so that's sort of a capturing that whole column. What about here, one s one? So all of these have one s one, and then n p one. Well, the first available p is two. So that lowest energy level is 2p1, and then 3p1, 4p1. So that whole column can be described by this. 
And so you'll have these ones along the bottom. Can you fill in the rest of the thing? So we can look at much more complicated atoms using the NIST Atomic Spectral Database. Now this is a this is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They've collected an enormous amount of data from from physicists worldwide as to the agreed upon assignment of all of these spectral lines and their energy levels. And they put this database together. Now why would we need this? Well, it's a great reference. If I see a spectral line say in the in the spectrum of a distant star and I want to know what that is. I can go to the atomic spectral database and look for all the different elements that have a wavelength transition at say 589.15 nanometers. And so I can filter all of my results by that and I could say, oh, well, that might be uh, sodium or it might be iron or it might be a presidimium or something strange, you know, and they have all of the elements in here. So you put in the element, you put in uh, the range, if you want to look in the whole visible region, you can put that in. And you could do units in nanometers or wave numbers, etc. You can hit retrieve data and it'll give you a table. Um, you could make a grow tree and diagram. And I put may not work. Sometimes it doesn't work. This year it seems to be working. You could have it produce a stick spectrum. Now, I don't know what the Saha LTE is, probably the, the scientists that built the, the tool. Uh, but anyway, it's the, it's the stick spectrum. Um, you can uh, give it an electron temperature. Uh, that's important for emission spectra because these, uh, when you're running current through something like these mercury tube lights, that system's not at equilibrium. You're running current through it. You know, thermal equilibrium is when a system comes to equilibrium with its environment, and that's emitting light. That's visible light. You know, at thermal equilibrium, to get that kind of light would be 20,000 Kelvin. And yet the glass, the, the surrounding Pyrex glass melts around 500 Celsius. So there's no way those tube lights are at thermal equilibrium. They would melt the glass when it got to 500 Celsius. Uh, so the, the temperature, the electronic temperature, since there's free electrons flowing around in those tubes, can be 20, 30,000 uh, so that it's emitting in the visible region. But the thermal temperature may be, you know, warm to the touch. It might be, you know, 100 uh, Fahrenheit or something like that. Something that's not going to burn you, but it still feels hot. Okay. So you could put in here the electron temperature and calculate what, uh, what the spectrum should look like. So here's the output table. You have the emission efficiency. So this is the... Um, related to the intensity. You have all kinds of things. You have the degeneracies of the states. You have the energies in wave numbers. So this is the energy of state, you know, like the upper state and the lower state. Look at this. We have electron configurations of each of the states. That's pretty cool. Um, we have the wavelength in air. This is in angstroms. You could also have the wavelength in nanometers. And then this, uh, this species, this is sodium and it's five. Okay. So I, I really hate the way they do this. Um, Na1 is, uh, is um, the uncharged atom. Na2 is the cation, sodium. Okay, see how that's totally screwed up from a chemist's perspective? Chemists didn't make this tool. <laughs> when you write a metal with a Roman numeral one, what does that tell you as a chemist? Yeah, it's a cation, it's a single, it's a plus one cation, you know, copper one is copper plus, but not to the physicists, so, that's a real, every, you know, when I first learned this, I was totally confused. What the heck is going on? I kept trying to do sodium zero, you know, and it would not do and because it's sodium one, not cation, but just the uncharged atoms, the first sodium. So this sodium five, that's, that's sodium four plus. So this is, you know, they have some really exotic species that they see in the visible spectrum. And look, the intensity for that transition is, you know, 
10 to the minus 9. It's a really weak peak. Um, so let's let's look at the Grotrian diagram for sodium. So this is the real Grotrian diagram for sodium. Pretty cool. <clears throat> so this this transition down here, that's the um, that's the first available transition, the longest wavelength transition. You see how sharp it is? Man, these uh, atomic spectral peaks are really sharp. That is a narrow peak. So it's just, there's no light, no light, no light. Then you have this super bright uh, yellow line and then no light. Uh, it's real easy to ionize sodium and, and warm it up. It's got a fairly decent vapor pressure. So sodium is great for, for illumination. You put a little bit of sodium into a vacuum and warm it up, you get a vapor and then electricity can go through there and excite those atoms and they can emit light very efficiently. And this is what our old street lights used to look like. So the yellow street lights are sodium vapor lights. Yeah. And we even still have some around campus. <coughs> they're efficient, but they're finicky and they break and so on. And so LED lights are more robust. And so now we see cities replacing <coughs> their sodium lights with LED lights and they look nicer. It's nice white light as opposed to this yellow light that makes everything look bad. So what's that ground state electron configuration? <coughs> It's what you would look, what you would predict with the Aufbau filling scheme: one s two, two s two, two p six, and then that last valence electron, the three s one. Okay, what about this one up here? So, looking at this Grotrian diagram down here, we see the two two p six n p. So it says, whoa, what happened? Subtitles? No, 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 no. How do we get out of this? Okay. All right, so then that's the NP1, right? So the first available P orbital, if we look at sodium, there's sodium. It's not gonna be the 2P1 because the 2P orbitals are already full. So what's the next open P orbitals? You're on row three, sodium. If I need to put that electron in a P orbital, the three Ps are open. So the first available p orbital for sodium is the 3p. So that electron now is in the 3p. So look at this electron configuration. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's essentially the neon core. And we're just moving that last electron around. So it has the neon electron configuration plus this extra electron that's hopping from the 3s to the 3p. What about this next column? It's the d's. So with the three d's are open. The 4s is open, so it could go up to the 4s. It could go to the 3d. So you have the, the neon core and that electron in the 3d. The 4p is open, so it could be in the 4p. Here's the 4f. It could hop up there. How do I know those are the f column? Look down here at the bottom. I have 2p6 in f. And so in that column are all the f orbitals. <clears throat> I've got several columns beyond that, which is strange. Remember, for the alpha-bell filling scheme, we never get above F. But in excited atoms, the next one is the G. <laughs> so the 5G1, and then the 6H1, and the 7I1. And that's as high as it goes in terms of the Grotrian diagram. Now, how would I know those? If you look down here, it says NG, NH, NI. So let's zoom in on those. See, we have the... 2p6 in G, 2p6 in H, 2p6 in I. How do I know what the first available N is going to be? Well, just think about this the progression. You know, the first available D is 3, the first available F is 4, the first available G is 5, the first available H is 6, the first available I is 7. So we're just cranking up that principal quantum number. And so it just follows that pattern. <clears throat> Any questions for this one? This one's kind of easy because we just have one electron popping around. It's going to be a 4F1 or a 7I1. And so it's, it's easy to think about that valence electron hopping around. We're going to do mercury next. So make sure you understand sodium. Want to get anything I can clarify?
Okay. So now for Mercury, this one breaks my brain a little bit. Here's the sodium light compared to the mercury light. Um, your eye fools you when you look at mercury lights. Uh, these are actually mercury lights, the fluorescent lights that we use. It doesn't really look green in here, okay? Um, <clears throat> but a mercury vapor light, when it first starts out, <clears throat> here's your spectrum. It has a red photon, which is, you know, 600 and, you know, a little bit higher than 600 nanometers. It has a green photon around 540. You know, that's light coming out. These are the spectral lines for Mercury. It has a blue and red, green, blue. Hey, that's that's white light. So I can look at that. My pigments in my eye are really broad broadband pigments, but this narrow line will excite those pigments in my eye. My eye thinks I'm getting all the wavelengths of light when I'm really getting very specific wavelengths of light. So my mind sees white light, even though I'm getting really narrow lines of light. Um, I noticed when I was in high school, I was a photographer for the yearbook. I'm taking sports pictures in the gym, volleyball, um, and these mercury lights flash. You don't really notice, but they flash. They, they build up the charge and it sort of flashes across. And I'm taking pictures of volleyball and all my pictures come out and they're kind of green. My eye interprets it as white light because of the pigments in my eye, but the camera element and the film really saw more of that green photon. It was the strongest photon in the picture. So all my pictures kind of looked like it was taken through a green filter. And I got the coolest picture of one of the spikes. The girl was coming down and because of the flashing lights, her arm was like tink, 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 tink. Like five little ghost images of her arm striking the volleyball. I was like, oh, that was the greatest photo ever. Okay. And then we have yellow photons and then we have blue green photons. So that's the emission spectrum of uh, mercury. <clears throat> Let's look at the electron configurations. Now mercury ground state, if you find mercury there, it looks pretty easy because it's a D10. So it's got the xenon core. All right. Then we're on the sixth row. So it's 6s2. Then we have the the four Fs, and we're past the four Fs. So that means we have four F fourteen. We filled in all of the seven orbitals, the F orbitals. There's seven of those, and two electrons each. So there's fourteen in the F subshell. Then we go across the Ds, and that's the five D block. So scandium was three D, yttrium was four D. We're on the lanthanum row. That's 5D. So 5D, we filled up all five of those orbitals with two electrons each. There's 10. So 5D, 10. So that should be the ground state. According to Aufbau's scheme, it should be xenon core, 6S2, 4F14, 5D, 10. <clears throat> but the ground state is this. Bizarre. We got it mostly right. Now, how would I know this? I would go to the NIST spectral database and figure it out. <laughs> You're not going to be able to look at that mercury and, and get this. You have to go look up to see what the science has told us the ground state or lowest energy state of mercury is. And this is what it is. It's xenon core. We got that right. 4F14, we got that right. 5D10, we got that right. But the S electron, it was just 6S1. And then nature decided hey if we put that other electron in the 6p they both have independent views of the nucleus and there's more ways to put that that one together so statistic statistically there's more chairs there so we have 6p there's three chairs if you will and so statistically there's more ways to make that atom and nature likes statistics so if there's more ways to make that atom and they have independent views of the nucleus then that's going to be the lower energy one. It's not low by much, but it's 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 a lower energy um, orbital. So that's the ground state. Notice all of these here are 5d10, 6s, np. And so we're in the 6p. What do you think the next one's going to be? 7p? Yeah, so let's see if that's right. Yeah, 7p1. And then 8p, 9p, you see how it, once you know that column, you can look down at the bottom and get the key 
and it's it's six s one n p. And so you got to look at that atom mercury. What's the next p orbital? What's well, going to be the six p? And then the next one would be seven, eight, nine. Just work your way up. So once you find the bottom row, bottom L, uh, energy level in a column, then the next ones you just crank that in up from there. Okay. Then we get to the one that we thought was the ground state, <laughs> which is really the one. That's one, two, three, fourth excited state of this atom. And then we have six S one, seven S one. And then we have over here, let's jump over. Uh, this is a D column, so 6S in D. So how do we know which D? Well, there was the 3D, 4D, 5D. So the next open group is the 6D. And then going up there, it would be 6D1, 7D1, 8D1, et cetera. Then we move over to this column. It's going to be an F column. So we filled the 4F so that 5Fs are open. So that should be the 5F1. And then the next one will be the 6F, 7F, and so on. It's not too hard once you get a foothold. And the little key down at the bottom, NIST is giving us that key so that we can figure it out. So this is the Grotrian diagram. And if you can understand this Grotrian diagram, you are like, I don't know, maybe one millionth of the population. <laughs> Now, there may be more than 350 people in the U.S. that understand this, but not many more. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the club. Uh, this is great stuff. <clears throat> so here's the simulated spectrum of the Mercury, that SA, the Saha LTE line plot for Mercury. And this is showing the ions. The, the black lines are for the neutral Mercury. So that's for Mercury... I'll go ahead and put zero up there for the charge. And this is for um, mercury cation. So it has to warm up. So sure enough, when the mercury's cold, the green line and the blue line are the first ones to show up. Then when it warms up, you've got more mercury cation and you get that red line and it starts to look more white. And so cold starts of mercury lamps should appear, appear blue-green first and then they start to warm up and you get the red and and uh, of the mercury cation. And then here's just the, the table showing those lines. And you can see the intensities over here, 4,000 versus all these 20s, 5s, 10s, and so on, and 1,100 and 240. So you can get the relative intensity lines and know which are the strongest lines. All right, thanks for your attention.